question more efficiently. I didn't pray for war, but I was ready for war. And then something strange happened. You see, I, one of the reasons why I was so focused on the Russians is I was an intelligence officer. And um, when I was in college, I studied Russian history. I studied the Russian language. Anybody who's heard me speak Russian would doubt that aspect of my own resume, but I remind people that while I was studying Russian language, I was also playing football and drinking beer. So the language aspect didn't uh, resonate as much as it should be. But I was a Russian area specialist, and that was on my resume. And in 1987, something remarkable happened. Ronald Reagan sat down with Mikhail Gorbachev, who at that time was the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet mm -hmm. Union, and they signed the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. There was a treaty to get rid of nuclear weapons. And for me, that resonated because I grew up next door to a nuclear weapon depot that I was afraid was going to cause my death. And suddenly, someone said, hey, you can go off and you can uh, be part of this treaty. You can implement this treaty to get rid of the nuclear weapons. And I was, I was of two minds because I wanted to kill Russians. That's all I ever did for five years. I woke up every morning, kill a Russian. And now they're saying, no, you're gonna go to the Soviet Union, you're gonna live amongst them, and you're gonna work in a cooperative fashion to get rid of nuclear weapons, which is a good thing. But it was with Russians who I wanted to kill. And this was a problem for me. So I, I arrived, I was actually, my life has been a series of remarkable events that have nothing to do with my skill set, just with me being in the right place at the right time. And uh, I actually was the first weapons inspector on the ground in the Soviet Union when the INF Treaty started. I was also the youngest weapons inspector on the ground. I was the least experienced weapons inspector. But you know how you become an expert? There's two routes to become an expert. One is to be a genuine expert. I mean, go to school, study it, become, get your PhD, be, write papers and all that. And the other one is to be the first person to ever do it. Because by definition, when it's done, you become the only person to have ever done it. You are, by default, the expert. And so I became an expert on on-site inspection, an expert on arms control inspections, et cetera, just because I was the first person to do it, and therefore, I was the guy they always turned to. They said, well, what happened up there? And then you'd say about it, then you'd build on it, you get more knowledge. And so I became a very good weapons inspector. What makes a good weapons inspector isn't just your willingness to do the job for your side, but in the case of this arms control treaty, it was to work with the other side. They weren't the enemy anymore. They were actually my colleagues. I could get up every morning and go to work with them, working together for a program that we had to both agree upon. It was a very strange thing for me to do, and I think it was strange for them as well because they looked at me the same way I looked at them. I was part of enemy number one. They were building missiles designed to blow up my country. And they were still building them while I was there. My job was to inspect those missiles. We joked about it when the missiles first started coming out of the factory. The first missile was named Pittsburgh. The second missile was named Des Moines. And the third missile was named Chicago before the people in Washington, D.C. said, this isn't funny, guys. And in many ways, it wasn't. But that's the kind of perverse humor you have to have when you deal with these kinds of subjects. Um, so I'm working with these people, working with these people, but we weren't connected. There was something missing there. Because when I looked at them, I didn't see humans. Mm. I saw Russians. And for me, Russians didn't resonate as fellow humans. This changed on New Year's Eve, 1988. Got an invitation to go to one of the Soviet inspectors or the Soviet escort's house. He was a nuclear, he was an engineer, not a nuclear, he was a rocket scientist. He built missile parts that go on the missiles that would blow up my house if there was ever a nuclear war. And he invited us, his own, they, all the inspectors got invited to the homes of their Russian counterparts. So I went there with three other people, and we arrived, we, we knocked on the door, the door opened up. Soviet departments are very small. Even if you're an engineer in a missile factory making a decent salary, it's a very small apartment, a very intimate setting. What I mean by that is there are no secrets. What you see is what you get. They don't have the luxury of being able to take all the stuff and stuff in the back room to make the appearance of, uh, of, of something other than what reality is. When you walk into a Soviet apartment, you see Soviet life. And I walked in to go with our inspectors and we saw that these people were just like us. They had dirty dishes in the sink. 
because obviously somebody was eating something as we came up and they didn't have time to clean it, so they tried to hide the dirty dish. But you see the dirty dish. They have paper stuffed under a book on the side, just like us. And then we started talking to them. Great sense of humor. They laugh. We talked about families. They cried. We talked about their children. Their eyes glowed. And you realize, and I was realizing, I just got hit with this epiphany at that point in time. I said, I don't want to kill these people anymore. I want to be friends with these people. It was one of those life-changing moments. It forever changed my life because at that moment, up until that time, I was the warrior extraordinaire, solely focused on closing with a destroyed unity for firepower maneuver. And after that point, I realized that is the most worthless mission imaginable. <laughs> That we, instead of learning to close with to destroy people, we should be learning to get to know people, to learn about people, to understand them as fellow human beings, and then work together to accomplish the impossible. What we were trying to do in the Soviet Union to get rid of these nuclear weapons was impossible. There were people in the Senate that didn't want it to happen, people in the White House that didn't want it to happen. We made it happen against impossible odds. And I'm very proud of the work that I and the other inspectors did. I'm very proud of my Soviet counterparts for what we accomplished. I left that job in, uh, in 1990 and went back to the Marine Corps. And right about that time, August 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And I got thrown out of school and thrown into a special planning cell for the Command of the Marine Corps to plan combat operations against uh, the Iraqis. And based upon the work that I did for them, I got requested to go to Saudi Arabia and work for General Schwarzkopf. So off I went to, to do this. Now, this got me back into the war. That was happy, you see. Because it wasn't the Russians. I, I didn't want to kill Russians anymore, but I was trained to do war. And now I have my chance to prove myself like any man would want to do. You're trained as a warrior. Here's your opportunity to be a warrior, to do the job. And I got heavily involved in what's called the counter-scud operation. That is, the Iraqi scuds were fired against Israel. Uh, the danger was that if we had stopped them, Israel would enter the war. The coalition that we had built up to confront Iraq would disappear and we could lose, so it was a big imperative to hunt these scuds down. And early on, I realized that uh, we were doing something wrong. You see, the intelligence said Iraq had 19 launchers, and by week two, we had killed 64. Now I'm a simple Marine, and I'm not very good at math, but I can tell you that that doesn't quite square. That meant we're killing something we're not supposed to be killing. We're killing something that isn't a scud launcher, and we're probably not killing any scud launchers because they keep firing the missiles at Israel. So I became involved in trying to hunt them down. And I, uh, I had an opportunity to work with Navy SEALs. Uh, they had something called a fast attack vehicle. It's a dune buggy. And they fly in with the dune buggy on helicopters where pilots get shot down and the dune buggy goes off and tries to recover the pilot and bring you back to safety. I came up with an idea that we were gonna go to a place that somebody said we destroyed a scud and I'm gonna do a technical assessment of it. I'm gonna go in and take bits and pieces of it, bring it back, build a radar cross section so that we can equip, we can fine tune our radars to hunt them down and kill them. And I needed to be on the site. So I met with the SEALs and <laughs> I remember the commander said, you ain't coming with us. And I said, why not? He said, because you ain't one of us. We're special, we're the SEALs, <laughs> but you're not. And um, I'm not giving up a space on my, on my doom buggy for you. And I turned to him and I said, "What?" what what space do you give up when you pick up the pilot? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you, you have your crew, and you get off the helicopter, you go to get the pilot. Where do you put the pilot? You kick off one of you guys? No, we put the pilot in the, uh, in, 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 in the platform on the side of the thing. I said, so why can't you take me in on that platform? And then he realized that I was serious, and the bottom line is they approved the mission. We're getting ready to go. And I have to tell you, as you're getting into the, the preparation for this, it's like a Anybody do sports like boxing or, or you know, competitive sports, then right before the whistle blows, the adrenaline you're feeling, the pump, the uncertainty, it's that moment before the action. This is war, guys. This is it. This is my chance to prove my manhood. I'm going to have a chance to do something where I will be confronted with life and death decisions, and I will get to measure myself as a man, because that's all I believe a man was. Somebody who could stand up and stare death in the face and not back down. So I'm ready to do this, I'm ready to rock and roll. It's the day before the mission's supposed to launch and we get a stand down order. Stand down. Some intelligence geek like me uh, went through the target data and realized that it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a, a destroyed scud after all, it was a Bedouin tent. 
and that the Bedouin family had been in the tent. And at night when it gets cold, they bring the sheep and the goats in. It's, it's a long thing, so you have heat.